When you live in South Florida like we do, the only way to get out is obviously north, hence our options are kind of limited. A good part of the trip involves a tedious, boring, mostly flat highway, no matter which option you take. I-75 is not the worst, but it goes along the west coast, so it's no good for us this time. State Route 27 and US-1 are a little more interesting because they go through cities and small towns, but it takes forever. The Florida Turnpike, <laughs> it's a horribly boring drive I refuse to take ever again and to add insult to injury, they actually even charge you for it. My route of choice north is uh, usually Interstate 95. Pretty boring as well, but at least it's stall free and the quickest way. We finally make it to Daytona Beach at around 9.30 p.m. We find a hotel to spend the night using the Hotels.com iPhone app. It is called uh, La Playa, and it was uh, pretty cheap, 60 bucks for the night. Good morning from Daytona Beach, Florida. We wake up at the crack of dawn to this breathtaking sunrise. Good morning. It is 7.20 in the morning and we have uh, waken up in this uh, near freezing temperatures to photograph the sunrise. Today we continue due north on the east coast of the United States. We're going to visit uh, St. Augustine, uh, America's oldest uh, city. Um, what else? Jacksonville and eventually we'll arrive at Savannah, Georgia. Meanwhile, enjoy the sunrise. Sorry if I seemed a little slow back there. I was uh, still half asleep and nearly frozen, but... It is time to say goodbye to La Playa. As we continue due north, it wasn't the greatest hotel, but for one night, a comfy bed and the beautiful and frigid oceanfront sunrise we just witnessed, it was more than adequate. We continue driving north here on A1A and uh, our destination, next destination is the Fort Matanza. As you can see, I've been uh, demoted to co-pilot, but that's okay, I'm taking a break. Moving along, the A1A runs almost parallel to the Atlantic coast, and we're going to be driving on this road for a while. It is a refreshing break from boring I-95. We pass by Flagler Beach near Palm Coast. This coastal area in Northeast Florida is called the First Coast for two main reasons. It is the first coast you see as you enter Florida through Jacksonville. More importantly, this was the first part of Florida colonized by Europeans, namely the Spaniards, as we are about to find out by visiting Fort Matanzas. Fort Matanzas is a national monument, and the National Park Service gives us a free ride on a boat to the fort, which guarded the southern mouth of the Matanzas River which accessed St. Augustine. The fort eventually became a ruin as the Spaniards lost Florida, and it was restored in the early 20th century. One major flaw of the restoration, the watchtower was originally a little narrower, and some other historical discrepancies. Two of the cannons are actually the original ones from the fort, the rest are just replicas. Of water. Today you can see that nature took care of it. Eventually that old area, unless the Army Corps of Engineers come over and dredge, dredge it out again, it's going to completely get covered by sand. Made with coquina, which is a stone made of crushed shells, and it's actually a fortification that used mortar from lime. Inside, we can see how life would have been for the poor Spanish soldiers stationed here, how they cooked, how they slept. Whoa! How they prayed. Look at the 
The latter gives the only access to the observation deck. Here we can get a commanding view of the Matanzas Inlet. One can only imagine the poor Spanish soldiers seeing the British ships offshore. Our quick excursion to the fort is over, and I must say kudos to the National Park Service as this whole experience was informative, pleasant in spite of the unusually cold weather, and totally free. There is also a nature trail, but it's not so great, not worth it really. Time to go! But before we do that, it is time to fulfill a childish whim of mine, if you will. I've always wanted to drive on the sand, on, on the beach, actually. drive recommended. And over here, they let you do it. Well, also back in Daytona, if you noticed uh, the speed limit signs at sunrise earlier today. But uh, here we go. We drive a few miles north to historic St. Augustine. St. Augustine is the oldest continuously occupied European settlement in the United States, founded in 1565 by Spanish explorer Pedro Menéndez de Avilés. However, Juan Ponce de Leon was around here before, in 1513, and he claimed the region for the Spanish crown. After a short drive, we arrive. The pretty building in the background is uh, the famous Flagler College. 500 feet. At the roundabout. What? <laughs> yeah, the GPS sucks sometimes. At the roundabout. What? <laughs> <laughs> What's up with Waze? That's it. We're using Google Maps for the rest of the trip. We pass by the San Marcos Castle, built in 1668 after a British attack and still stands today as the nation's oldest fort, now run by the National Park Service as the Castillo de San Marcos National Monument. The GPS directs us to the closest parking lot. St. Augustine is famous for having the oldest uh, drugstore in the US. I often question the authenticity of these places. Apparently they sold uh, liquor, tobacco, medicine and Indian remedies. We continue exploring this uh, touristy town. We are walking along St. George's Street here in St. Augustine. This is the main drag, St. George's Street. The tourist trap, if you will. Here's supposedly the United States' oldest wooden school from 1716. Although there is an older claim in Staten Island, New York, from 1696. So I have a good conspiracy theory that all this is fake. Who knows? The cobblestone streets, the Cuban flag. I was born in Cuba, so whenever we see the flag, we usually take a picture. The beautiful intercoastal view is a must-do photo opportunity. Well, we'll visit the Ponce de Leon Fountain of Youth some other time because we are kind of pressed for time now, so we must go on. It's 1 p.m., time to leave. Earth we go. We decide to take a scenic coastal A1A instead of faster I-95 once again. We drive for 45 minutes through Pontevedra Beach, which is a mostly oceanfront residential neighborhoods with multi-million dollar homes and golf courses. Very lavish. And we are approaching Jacksonville, Florida, the most populous city in the state, if you only count the people living within the city limits and not the suburbs. Also, quite musical, as uh, popular bands such as uh, Leonard Skinner and Limp Biscuit both originated here. 
also Hip Hop Acts, 95 South, 69 Boys and the Quad City DJs, uh, very popular in the 90s. They all came from here. We are now arriving at Jacksonville. And we are super hungry, so we are not going to waste any time with any nonsense. We are going straight to this place called uh, Jacksonville Landing. They are having some kind of Christmas show. So we decided to break one of uh, Traveler's uh, rules and uh, had lunch at the tourist trap, namely at Hooters. Sometimes you need something familiar. And the show goes on. I would imagine that a place like this would be more full of people on a Saturday afternoon, but I guess not. Maybe everybody was indoors due to the chilly weather. The Jacksonville Landing was designed and built by the same company that built Miami's Bayside and some other similar places, and one can sort of see the resemblance. Crossing the bridge, we visit the Friendship Fountain on the other side of the river. Water jets uh, move to the rhythm of the music, Bellagio style, but in this case, uh, more bouncy music would definitely enhance the effect, I think. City of Jacksonville, St. John's River Park and Marina. Well, time to continue. Not before driving through the historic Riverside neighborhood. One cool thing about this trip going north is the change in vegetation. As you can see, there are no more palm trees. As we continue north, the trees will have less and less leaves. And after a few miles, we are in Georgia. Or should I say, Georgia is on our mind. We are quickly approaching the city of Savannah, Georgia. We're about an hour away. And, um, I-95 seems endless. I have no idea what I want to see. Bye. We finally arrive at Savannah. We, or should I say Waze, the GPS, gets a little lost finding the hotel, but we do get there eventually. We have gotten a great deal using the Hotel Tonight app on the iPhone, it must if you're traveling like us uh, with no reservations. We landed the Hyatt in the historic district. We have arrived at the Hyatt. It doesn't really get any better than this. It was less than a hundred bucks, and of course, when you get these great deals, uh, they nickel and dime you for everything else, but I believe it was worth it. And that's me. And we have... We have a great view of the river from our room. Later that night, uh, we take a stroll along River Street, which has a bunch of shops, uh, restaurants and bars. They have a Wet Willys, which used to be one of my favorite bars in Miami Beach before it got too popular.
We really want to walk around, but we're exhausted from the long road trip. So we decided to finish the night at the Bohemian Hotel next door, which has a rooftop nightclub called Rocks on the Roof, with live music and great ambiance. From Savannah, Georgia. Good morning. We walk around this historic and beautiful city. Uh, we see City Hall from Bull Street, uh, which is right next to our hotel, and then enjoy the beautiful vegetation of Johnson Square. We walk up to Alice Square and City Market, which is a touristy pedestrian street with a bunch of bars and restaurants. At the end of City Market, across Franklin Square, we see the first African Baptist Church, which claims to be derived from the first Black Baptist congregation in North America. They do have a museum. As you've seen, the historic district is dotted with a grid of all these charming squares, uh, such as uh, Chippewa Square, where they filmed the movie Forrest Gump. The actual bench in the movie was a fiberglass prop, and it doesn't really exist. Bummer. Passing by the first uh, Girl Scouts headquarters in the United States, we arrive at Clary's for breakfast. We are having breakfast at uh, Clary's. The place has been here forever. This uh, has been a Savannah hangout place since 1903, and it was made even more famous after it was portrayed in the book Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. By Lafayette Square, as we head back north on Abercorn Street, we see the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. Its a congregation was founded in the late 1700s by French immigrants. A little further down the street, we pass by Colonial Park Cemetery. It's the oldest one in Savannah. It was established in 1750 and is a popular destination for ghost tours. It was vandalized by the federal troops during the Civil War, but uh, it has been restored ever since. We are back at Bay Street, uh, which runs parallel to River Street, uh, where the hotel is, and there's a bunch of quirky shops uh, right behind the riverfront shops. This is the oldest continuously operating English Freemasons Lodge in the Western Hemisphere. Yeah, amazing the stuff you learn on the internet. Okay, it's time to leave the comfort of our riverfront room as we must continue on the road, but not before seeing a little more of beautiful Savannah. Grabbing a tip from travel writer Pico Wire, we turn off the GPS and try to reach our next destination on pure instinct and the sense of orientation. In this case, I'm trying to find Forsyth Park, which is just uh, south of the historic district. And uh, here we are. Uh, let's go around the park. What the heck? Savannah, by the way, is the historical birthplace of Georgia. It was settled in 1733. The city maintains its antebellum charm, antebellum meaning ante, before bellum war, so basically it was paired the devastation of the Civil War. The Major gave Sherman's men run of the city in exchange for leaving it untouched. Pretty much like the French did with Paris during World War II. That's why that cemetery got all messed up, but everything else uh, was left uh, pretty much intact. So, we can see it today. Smart guy, that Mayor. Not brave, but smart. Okay, enough of that. Uh, we passed by Mansion, which is a very luxurious hotel with a very nice nightclub where I played with my band a few years back. Well, let's uh, see Forsyth Park, the iconic overhanging trees, the Forsyth Fountain, which dates back to uh, 1858, the Spanish moss draped oak trees. <laughs> There's a bronze bust of Major General Lafayette Maclaws in front of the Confederate monument back there. We walk 
back to the fountain, which is uh, similar to those in Place La Concorde in Paris. And we make sure we are observing the sidewalk rules, of course. And with that, we almost say goodbye to Savannah for now. Uh, lastly, we cruise along historic Jones Street. It's a very picturesque, uh, luxurious residential area. Of course, the cobblestones don't help with the camera stability, but who cares? We pass by Clarice once again, and the place where I stayed when I came to Savannah with the band back in 2006 or 2007. It's the Blue House. Time to hit the road, as we continue relentlessly on our journey north towards New York City. The Talmadge Memorial Bridge spans the Savannah River between the states of Georgia and South Carolina. We are driving on US 17 towards Charleston. And we are now in the great state of South Carolina. After a while on US 17, we move over to I-95 in order to save some time. Our time here in Charleston is uh, very limited, so we're just going to walk along Market Street, uh, see the waterfront and have a late lunch. The historic downtown, where we are, is located on the peninsula, formed uh, by the Ashley and Cooper rivers. The city market on Market Street dates back to the 1790s. The indoor market begins at the historic Market Hall at the corner of Market and Meeting Streets and stretches for four blocks ending at East Bay Street. This is where the also historic Custom House is located. From the dock we see Arthur Ravenel Bridge and the Charleston Harbor and Castle Pickney on tiny Schutz Folly Island. We have a late lunch at this place called Magnolias, which was recommended by roadfood.com. It is a fancy, delicious southern cuisine. But time flies when you're having fun, and uh, in the winter it gets dark way too early. We want to reach uh, New York by Christmas Day, so we must uh, say hasta la vista to Charleston and continue due north. Revisiting this pretty town is a must. We will spend the night at North Myrtle Beach. But before checking in at our hotel, we are going to cruise along South Ocean Boulevard, which is the heart of Myrtle Beach. At this time of the year, it's not surprisingly deserted. It is late December and the temperature is pretty low, but it's, it's very much reminiscent of our own Miami Beach. This is another place we must revisit in the summer when it is at its prime. But this time, we're just here to sleep. We are actually staying at a place a little further north. So we're staying at the Baywatch in the North Myrtle Beach. This place is like a ghost town. Good morning. Today we continue north towards Wilmington, North Carolina. Keep right at the fork. 
Wilmington's historic downtown sits on the northern bank of the Cape Fear River. The city is mostly famous for its beaches, the seafood, and historic plantations. Some antebellum houses and other buildings survived the Civil War as the city didn't see much action. The port, however, was very important to the Confederate side as uh, supplies from England arrived here. We have breakfast at this place called the Dixie Grill, uh, one of the few places we found open this early on Christmas Eve. After breakfast, uh, we walk towards the river. They have also these uh, historic tours on horse-drawn carriages, which uh, seem very informative, but we don't have the time on this particular occasion. We must content ourselves uh, with a stroll along the riverfront and the site of battleship USS North Carolina, moored here. Once considered the world's greatest sea weapon and one of the most decorated battleships of World War II. Wilmington was also the filming location of the fictitious town of Capeside, from the late 90s uh, TV series Dawson's Creek. This is another place that definitely deserves a less rushed visit. What else is new? Back to the car! We drive around a little bit on this historic downtown area and then it is off to our nation's capital, Washington DC. We continue driving towards New York. Three hours and over 180 miles after we leave Wilmington, North Carolina, we enter the state of Virginia. And naturally, we stop for the photo op. We are driving almost non-stop all the way to Washington, D.C., and we are about halfway there. We pass by Richmond, Virginia, and Fredericksburg. And uh, no matter where you are, traffic will always slow down by the sight of an accident. The weather deteriorates uh, gradually. When we arrive, we would have driven for over six hours along 370 miles, nearly non-stop. As night falls, we arrive at our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Continue on I-395 North. Our hotel is the Capitol Skyline, very well located. Actually, you can kind of see the Capitol building from our window. We do a little bit of sightseeing under the cold rain. The Washington Monument. The Capitol building. With uh, this nasty weather, I actually give up on the video camera and just take a few pictures. There's uh, me and my nine-year-old car, which has brought us safely all the way here. This is the Jefferson Memorial, with its famous view of the Washington Monument and the White House. We've had enough of this rain. Let's enjoy Christmas Eve dinner at this place in Georgetown called Farmers Fishers Bakers. After a full day of driving 
and the horrendous weather we've endured, it's a nice break. In the morning, we take the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. It is a beautiful drive in the early morning mist. It is a shame we couldn't see much of DC this time, but don't worry. Eventually, we have to drive back south, so we'll revisit. We arrive at Baltimore, the M&T Bank of Football Stadium and the Oriole Park. As we reach the Hilton, we turn right onto Camden Street towards the Convention Center. We drive east on Pratt Street and continue roaming the deserted streets. It is Christmas morning after all, so I assume everybody is opening presents. Making this trip is present enough for me. We continue driving along the Inner Harbor and venture into Canton Park. But there's really not a whole lot to see here, so we say enough wandering. Let's head east on O'Donnell Street towards I-95 North. We cross the Susquehanna River, the longest one on the East Coast. And pretty soon we arrive to the state of Delaware and the city of Wilmington, largest city in the state. Off to Philly we go, and guess what? Another state line crossed. Welcome to Pennsylvania. As we get off on 15th Street, one of the first uh, things we see is the City Hall to the left. We continue south on 15th Street into the district of South Philly, the birthplace of the Philly cheesesteak, and not exactly the most uh, touristy part of the city, so we turn back north on 16th. This mural is called the Children of Philadelphia and is one of the many murals against crime. These murals are all around the city and they have become a symbol of Philadelphia. South Street is the invisible border between South Philly and Center City. We are just uh, driving around aimlessly. It is not our intention to see Philadelphia today. Everything seems to be closed on Christmas Day, so we just want to take a quick look around and continue on. After a few miles, we are in New Jersey. Sorry, no pull out to take a picture. We have it on good authority that the best place for brunch on Christmas Day is Harold's New York Deli. And don't let the name deceive you, they are located in Edison, New Jersey, and they are famous for the gigantic portions. We definitely ordered too much food. A shake, soup, chili fries, a meatloaf sandwich, a, a hot dog. What were we thinking? Start spreading the news. I'm arriving today. This is it. We are approaching our final destination.
We have arrived at New York and we are going to spend Christmas evening in the city. We drive on the Lincoln Tunnel, crossing under the Hudson River. See you on the other side. Yep, New York, we have arrived. Our hotel, the Best Western Plus President on the right, which we found using the Hotel Tonight app. Very helpful. We got a great deal around 100 bucks, just a block away from Times Square. We park right across the street for around 45 bucks a night. As soon as we get settled, we get out and walk towards Times Square. Let's get the tourist thing out of the way. This is New York. No other place comes close. Yeah, that's us. Walking down Broadway, we get a glimpse of the Empire State Building, dressed in its Christmas colors. The line to go up is hours long, so we keep on walking, this time towards Fifth Avenue. This is the famous uh, New York Public Library. We turn right on 42nd towards Grand Central Terminal. We walk in take this panorama. The Chrysler Building and the MetLife, formerly Pan Am, and uh, get a life in certain video game. We're back. I don't remember why, I think we had to pass by the hotel to pick up something. We walk towards the Rockefeller Center on 6th Avenue, among the crowds of people. Passing by Radio City Music Hall, the famous Art Deco style theater. This year, the Rockettes celebrating their 85th anniversary. We try to get a glimpse of the Rockefeller Center skating rink, but the crowds are just too large. Let's get into the glass elevator, maybe we are luckier. And we are. We decide to go to the top of the rock observation deck, since we couldn't go up to the Empire State Building. Some say this view is actually better, because from here you can actually see the Empire State. The elevator has a glass ceiling in which they project footage by NBC through the decades. The view towards Central Park is breathtaking. But it's even better looking towards the south. The Chrysler, the MetLife, the Empire State with the new World Trade Center under construction in the distance behind it. Times Square to the right. In this room called the, the Breezeway, supposedly the lights of a certain color follow you around. I don't know. Let's get out of here before I go nuts. This is strange. 
Back at the ground level, the crowds are still enjoying the magic of Christmas. We were on the way. This is a very photogenic and iconic steam you've been seeing coming from under the streets. It's actually a byproduct of the city's heating system, which uses steam naturally. <laughs> And this statue of the Greek titan Atlas dates back to 1937. As the action starts to die down and the temperature drops below freezing, we return to the hotel, only to spy on our unsuspecting neighbors. They're having some kind of get-together. And after a while they go to sleep too, and so do we. In the morning, we take the subway to downtown. It is our intention to visit the September 11 memorial. The memorial is right next to the new construction site and they have a TSA-style security checkpoint with X-rays, body scanners, magnetometers, the works, and of course, we couldn't photograph. I don't want to get started with my opinions about all this security theater, let's just say I think they're overdoing it a little bit. One thing is common sense, safety, but this is borderline paranoia. Anyways, on a more serious note, the somber memorial honors the victims of the September 11 attacks. Each fountain built at the exact spot where the Twin Towers were located. This tree in the middle was recovered from the rubble and it was replanted here as a symbol of hope and rebirth. Time to get back to our hotel, as uh, checkout time uh, is upon us. We have lunch at this excellent Vietnamese restaurant right next to the hotel called Saigon 48. And off we go. We are going to do something very few tourists do in New York. We are going to drive around the city. We drive east on 48th Street and then turn left onto 6th Avenue, surrounded by a sea of taxi cabs. We once again arrive by the corner of the Radio City Music Hall. We continue speeding north towards Central Park. We turn left on West 59th Street, Central Park South, towards the Columbus Circle. The tall towers at the end are the Time Warner Center. They are home, of course, to Time Warner Incorporated, as well as the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, CNN Studios, a shopping mall, and a theater. At the Columbus Circle, we turn right onto Central Park West and the Upper West Side. On the corner of 64th Street, we see the Harper Lee Hall, formerly Madonna's home. She sold it in early 2013 for almost $20 million. By 65th Street, we encounter the Holy Trinity Lutheran Church and continue going north, cruising along the lavish condos of the rich and famous. The prominent tower, a couple of blocks away to the left, is the San Remo, home to Demi Moore, Steve Martin, and many other celebrities. Even the late Steve Jobs used to own an apartment there, although he never lived in it and eventually sold it to Bono. This building to our left is the Dakota, where John Lennon used to live with Yoko Ono. She still lives there. The New York Historical Society The American Museum of Natural History 
And this massive building in front of us is the Burrsford, home to Diana Ross and Jerry Seinfeld. I don't know about you, but I've seen enough celebrities for one day. Suffice to say that in order to live in any of these buildings to the left, you need to have some serious dough. Seriously. And as uh, Central Park ends at Frederick Douglass Circle, so does the luxury. And it's time for me to fill up. I mistakenly pulled uh, up to the full service pump. We don't have those uh, where I live. It was a costly mistake. We continue on to Harlem, a major African-American residential, cultural and business center. During the 1920s and 30s, there was a great artistic movement in theater, literature and music called uh, the Harlem Renaissance. And ever since, it has been up and down with periods of crime and great violence and calmer periods like the present. It is still mostly a poor neighborhood with all the problems that come with that. Contrary to popular belief, this was not the birthplace of the Harlem Shake. As we turn right on 135th Avenue, we are going into the Spanish Harlem. Sometimes it is cool just to stop and see the people crossing the street, the cars going by, the train far away in the distance, a slice of life in the city, a slice, if you will, of the neighborhood. We go back, back south on 5th Avenue and continue zigzagging east on 134th Street, south on Park Avenue, which in this area goes right next to the railroad tracks. We turn west on 106. The red brick uh, low-income buildings and yet another slice of the neighborhood through its people crossing the street. We have turned off the GPS, so we even take a wrong turn here. Uh, sometimes though, it is good to get lost. I mean, we obviously seen the map and know the basic layout of the city, but it's good to explore its nooks and crannies sometimes. South we go on 2nd Avenue, approaching the Upper West Side, one of the most affluent neighborhoods. We observe the contrasts of the big city, from one of its poorest neighborhoods into its most exclusive one. It's uh, merely a couple of blocks. Look at this nice high-rise. Wouldn't you like to live there? South we go on Lexington Avenue and turn right onto 81st Street, but oops, it is blocked, so we must maneuver backwards. Not the safest thing. We turn right again to blocks down on 79th. We drive west, crossing famous Madison Avenue. We reach Central Park. Here's another slice of city life, a little different this time, won't you say? We turn left on Fifth Avenue, going south, one of the most famous avenues in the city. Fifth Avenue divides Manhattan into east and west. It has been called the most expensive street in the world. Just as we start approaching the south end of Central Park and the shopping section of this avenue, a light snow starts to fall, as predicted by the weather service. We are from South Florida, so the slightest bit of snow is a major event for us. It is very exciting, even if the snow melts as soon as it hits the ground. And it starts to fall a little harder. We approach the corner of 59th Street and 5th Avenue, the southeastern corner of Central Park. This is where the famous Plaza Hotel is located, and also the famous Glass Cube Apple Store. We enter the famous shopping district with Louis Vuitton and Tiffany's leading the way. Yes, it is Tiffany's from the Audrey Hepburn movie. I think that every major luxury retailer has a boutique within these 10 city blocks. By the way, Frito-Lay did not pay us any money for the product placement. I don't even like the product. We particularly admire the holiday decorations at the Fendi store in front of the St. Thomas Church.
We continue passing by Cartier and the St. Patrick's Cathedral, which is under renovation. Nothing to see, unfortunately. We pass by the Rockefeller Center as we start to get a glimpse of the Empire State Building to the right. And we continue going south along Fifth Avenue in Midtown to our right, the New York Public Library. Here's a view of the Empire State Building through the sunroof. We entered the Gramercy Flatiron District. Uh, at its heart, Madison Square and the iconic Flatiron Building, one of the tallest in the city at the time of its completion in 1902. Across Madison Square Park, there is the Metropolitan Life Tower, which uh, was the world's tallest building between 1909 and 1913, only to be surpassed by the Woolworth Building. The snow starts to fall even harder now. Fifth Avenue ends at Washington Square Park in the Greenish Village. Now let's get lost under the snow, shall we? It is what we came here for, after all. All this area is part of the New York University, but of course we didn't know that at the time. We turned left onto Green Street and then right on 8th Street the Cooper Union Library to the right. This black cube is called Alamo, and it was sculpted in 1967 by Tony Rosenthal. It is a popular meeting place here in the East Village. We continue going east on 8th Street until we reach Tompkins Square Park. This area is called Alphabet City, because the avenue names are letters. For example, the avenue we are turning into is Avenue B. We go further south on Avenue C, Luisaida Avenue, until we reach Houston. I mean, Houston. It's spelled like the city of Houston in Texas, but pronounced Houston. Houston Street is the boundary between several neighborhoods, most notably NoHo, which stands for north of Houston, and Soho, south of Houston. Oof, it's really coming down now. We go back north on 6th Avenue, also called the Avenue of the Americas. We turn left or west onto 16th Street and then south on 7th. And west on 11th Street, right at the intersection with diagonal Greenish Avenue, in order to see the neighborhood away from the main streets. We make a ride on Hudson and then back south on Bleecker into the heart of the village. And they have a sign to prove it. We eventually go south on Broadway towards Chinatown. We get a glimpse in the distance of the Woolworth Building, as I mentioned before, the tallest building in the world for several years. Eventually we turn left or east onto Canal Street, the main drag of Chinatown. But before immersing ourselves in Chinatown, let's turn left right here onto Mulberry Street to see a little bit of uh, Little Italy. Little Italy is basically just a couple blocks and perhaps a little too touristy. I mean, even the fire hydrants are painted in the colors of the Italian flag. It's very picturesque. Mm -hmm. 
Then we immerse ourselves into Chinatown, which feels like a different country all to itself. We decide to continue towards downtown, under the pouring snow. The snow, however, doesn't deter the tourists from taking a picture with the famous Wall Street bull sculpture. The bull is a symbol of financial prosperity. And sometimes, just optimism, wishful thinking. Ever heard of a bull market? We are actually a couple of blocks away from actual Wall Street and the stock exchange. But it's getting late, and I've been driving for hours. We are tired and hungry. I make a wrong turn and we end up on the Brooklyn Bridge, <laughs> crossing the East River into the borough of Brooklyn. At this point, we are not really in the mood for sightseeing, so we just turn around, take the bridge back to Manhattan. We have decided to sleep in New Jersey tonight, for economic reasons mostly. Besides, we are going to the hotel next door to where we stayed back in 1994. A trip down memory lane. After getting stuck in rush hour traffic, we are able to take the Holland Tunnel to the New Jersey shore. I have no video of the rest of the day, but let's just say that because in South Florida we don't really invest a lot of money in tires, I almost paid for it, as the streets in Jersey were more than a little slippery due to all the snow and ice. We finally made it, skidding all the way to the parking lot. <sighs> Good night. Good morning. We spent the night at the Holiday Inn Express in North Bergen, New Jersey. Right next door, there is the Days Inn where we stayed back in 1994. We haven't changed that much, have we? Many of my fellow Cuban-Americans who now live in Miami called this area home when they first arrived at the United States. Many recall Union City and Burger Lang Avenue with a certain sense of nostalgia. What they didn't miss, apparently, were the crude winters and having to shovel snow. Most of them worked hard, saved some money and eventually bought a house in Miami. I want to explore this area a little bit, mainly Avenida Bergen Line, which is how they used to call it, and the city of Union City. Excuse the cacophony, but that's actually what the sign says. We cruise around, seeing all the signs in Spanish. Kind of reminds you a little bit of Little Havana. They even have a botanica. <laughs> El Pollo Supremo, we used to have those in Miami back in the day. Pollo Tropical put him out of business though. Another fine example of marketing triumphing over quality. Before crossing state lines, we drive up to John F. Kennedy Boulevard East to admire this view of the Hudson River and the island of Manhattan on the other shore. Downtown and the new World Trade Center under construction, the Empire State Building and Midtown. The Time Warner Towers, the Upper West Side, and eventually Harlem in the distance. Okay. 
Our next destination is a little further north. We drive into the borough of Bronx, across the George Washington Bridge. This is, by the way, the northernmost point of our entire road trip. We take I-87 south, passing under the Aqueduct Bridge, the oldest surviving bridge in the city. One of the first uh, points of interest uh, we want to pass by is Yankee Stadium. This modern ballpark you see here uh, was finished in 2009, and it replaced the original historic 1923 Yankee Stadium. This is the Bronx, ladies and gentlemen, the birthplace of hip-hop music. Driving under the train tracks, I make a wrong turn. Oops. Oh, oh shit, there's one way. We make a left on 161st Street, the correct turn this time. It is our intention to reach the hub, which is the heart of the South Bronx. We turn right onto Melrose Avenue for that purpose, but uh, never make it all the way to the famous hub. We decide it's getting late and we rather visit the projects on Washington Avenue. I know, I think we're a little ADD. We go north on 3rd Avenue. Until the early 70s, there was a train line running above this street called the L for Elevated. You may have seen it in movies. We make a left on 168th Street and then a right onto Park Avenue. The place is somewhat deserted. It's supposed to be one of the roughest areas in town, the Webster Projects, according to our on-the-go research, but it doesn't look all that bad. But we'll lock the doors just in case. Iglesia Pentecostal. It seems to be at least partially a Latin neighborhood based on the Spanish sign on the Pentecostal church. We continue driving along Washington Avenue in the South Bronx, in this uh, shady looking neighborhood, which happens to be the poorest congressional district in the United States. They have been trying to revitalize the neighborhood after the economic collapse of the 1970s and the 80s, but as you can see, they still have a long way to go. Well, maybe we should get out of here. Ever since I saw the movie Warriors in the early 80s, I have wanted to go to Coney Island. And that's where we're heading now. We take I-278 towards Queens and Brooklyn. We take uh, this bridge into Wards Island and then the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge over the East River into the borough of Queens. We continue south with the Manhattan skyline to the right, crossing the Kosciusko. We are now in Brooklyn. Now on the Belt Parkway we see Staten Island to the right and the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in front of us. Let's stop for the scenic view. The sight of the bridge is uh, pretty breathtaking. It was the longest uh, suspension bridge in the world in 1964 and it still is the longest bridge span in the Americas. We finally arrive to our coveted Coney Island, and I must say it's a little bit of a disappointment. Of course, we are arriving only two months after Superstorm Sandy. Part of the park is still being used for the recovery effort. Still, the area looks a little run down.
This is Coney Island. Apparently, the amusement park has suffered heavy damage during the storm, and you can see sand dunes have formed way inland. The sand is probably a couple feet higher than normal. The wooden deck seems undamaged though, at least to my untrained eyes. That's it, we're going back to Brooklyn, hoping to eat a slice of pizza at Grimaldi's. We are speeding west on the Belt Parkway. In the distance, once again, we see the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. As we turn north, we get to see a great view of the lower Manhattan skyscrapers in the distance. As we get closer, we get a glimpse of the Statue of Liberty. And as we arrive, uh, well, don't, Google gets lost, uh, apparently, so do we. We try to find the parking to no avail, and we finally see Grimaldis further down the street next to the white building, but the line is not surprisingly long, and there's no parking, so we keep going. We settle for this place called My Little Pizzeria. The pizza is uh, very good, actually, at this uh, neighborhood joint, full of locals. Who needs Grimaldis? That place is too touristy anyways, uh, hence the long line. We walk back to the car along the lively streets of Brooklyn. It's rather cold. Once again, we pass by the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, but this time we are actually driving on it, towards the borough of Staten Island. We are beginning our journey south, back to Florida. We have decided to spend the night in Atlantic City, uh, to check out the boardwalk and to try our luck at the slot machines. As night falls, we arrive. It looks like a mini Vegas in the distance. We are staying at the Caesars. One little known fact is that the properties in the Monopoly game were originally named after locations and streets in Atlantic City. This is Atlantic Avenue, for example, and the next one is Pacific Avenue. Now we all know what Boardwalk stands for. We cruise along Pacific Avenue going south to see what's going on. Not much, apparently. Must be the cold weather. Okay, let's go back north. We pass by our hotel, the Caesars, uh, once again, and continue exploring. I think we took a wrong turn, so let's go back to the Caesars and check in. This is the famous uh, Atlantic City Boardwalk. We take a stroll along the boardwalk. Also inspecting some of the damage perpetrated by Superstorm Sandy two months earlier. Yeah, yeah this was supposed to be a hand level. This was supposed to be the level of your hand. Yeah, and this is, I'm guessing there was wood down here. Was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is all covered in sand? It's all covered in sand. Holy shit. <laughs> 
Well, let's risk our lives here. And hopefully, no any good nails sticking up. I guess we were not really supposed to be there. <laughs> okay. Back inside. We've been told that this fountain at the Caesars is like a mini Bellagio. Let's see if it's true. Okay, it's time to say goodnight and goodbye to Atlantic City for that matter, as tomorrow we leave towards Washington DC. Meanwhile, enjoy the fountain. It's quite nice. Good morning from Atlantic City. We spent the night at the Caesars, and I don't think this gambling thing is for us really. Our winnings for the night, oh well. If you've been following our journey, you know that we couldn't really enjoy our nation's capital on the way north due to the bad weather and lack of time. But today we have a little more time to explore and frankly, the weather is, shall I say, glorious. <laughs> We are leaving Atlantic City and I wonder who would do that to an Ian, but anyways, I digress. We drive non-stop to DC, passing by many of the places we visited on the way north. Wilmington, the Susquehanna River, Baltimore, we finally arrive and park at the Ronald Reagan building on Pennsylvania Avenue a mere two blocks away from the White House. Although, I must warn you, the blocks in DC are very long, so... <laughs> Looking back towards the Capitol building, we begin walking towards the White House. The bleachers almost ready for Obama's second inauguration. We continue walking on Pennsylvania Avenue admiring the Washington architecture, passing by the Treasury Department. We arrive at the South Lawn and take a long look at one of the most secure buildings in the world. Hello there. We continue walking on this uh, large open area, which is called the National Mall. It extends all the way from the Capitol building to the Lincoln Memorial uh, with the Washington Monument right in the middle. The Lincoln Memorial was built in the form of a Greek Doric temple. The 36 columns symbolize the 36 states of the Union at the time of Lincoln's death. And there's the statue of Abe himself, sculpted by Daniel Chester French. Washington emanates a grandiosity, with its uh, large open spaces, oversized Greek-inspired architecture, and why not, a gigantic Egyptian obelisk smack in the middle. The National World War II Memorial honors the 16 million Americans who served uh, during the Second World War. Uh, the monument has uh, 16 pillars, 
heritage engraved with uh, one of the 48 states at the time of the war, as well as uh, DC and the rest of the American territories at the time. Our next point of interest is the Washington Monument, which has remained closed, unfortunately, since the 2011 earthquake. There's the White House again, from the Washington Monument. We were here back in 1994. Notice that there is no World War II memorial yet. Uh, the DC was a much uh, less paranoid place back then. It's uh, getting chilly, so we go back to the car to get our heavier jackets. And we have lunch at this place called the Occidental Grill. Fancy place. Delicious food. We go back to the National Mall uh, and get to see this beautiful view of the Capitol building almost at dusk. And the Smithsonian Castle. and the Washington Memorial, the Washington Monument, one more time. The Smithsonian Castle houses the Smithsonian Institution's offices and information center. The, the Smithsonian was created in 1846 for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Today we are visiting the Air and Space Museum and I'm really looking forward to this one. It's one of those museums where you are seeing actual artifacts of, of the not so distant past, such as the Alan Shepard capsule, for example, the first American in space and second human to have that honor, uh, the Gemini 7, the first American spacewalk. Amazing to see how small these early capsules were, they were like claustrophobic. Uh, here we come face to face with the Cold War era Soviet ballistic missile the SS-20 Saber. There's the Pioneer and the Apollo 11 command module. There is so much interesting stuff in this place. I, I'm like a child at a candy store. I even get to touch a moon rock. I'm touching a moon rock. The Viking never came back to so. This is the Viking uh, Mars lander. Uh, while the Viking 1 and 2 were on Mars doing their thing, this third vehicle was used on Earth to simulate their behavior. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, the color chart for the camera for color balance. This uh, right here is a sample of aerogel. Uh, it's the lightest uh, solid ever created. It was used to collect uh, comet samples and interstellar dust. Now let's go back in time to the earliest flying contraptions. Brothers weren't original. We got to see different engines, planes employed, and the cockpit layouts from the 1940s to the 1970s to the legendary Boeing 747 jumbo jet. The mother of all planes, even to this day. Then we step on what I believe is a DC-3 and we see what traveling was like back in the day. Much more comfortable, I must tell you. Uh, probably much more expensive as well. Predator drones and other planes. Yeah, it's V'ger. Yep, this is Voyager. Launched in the 1970s, it is traveling further than any other man-made spacecraft ever, to the border of our solar system. Going back in time once again, here's the original Wrights Brothers flyer. <laughs> Amelia Earhart. And finally, some more space stuff. We get a peek inside Skylab, the original space station. It orbited Earth from 1973 to 1979 and then it crashed into the Pacific. There is so much more stuff, the lunar module, the Hubble telescope. You gotta come here and see it in person and by the way, 
it's free. Well, it's time to go. The Air and Space Museum is definitely one of my favorite ones in DC. But then again, I'm kind of partial to all this space stuff. Then turn right onto Constitution Avenue Northwest. We continue our journey south. We spend the night at the Country Inn in Petersburg, a few miles south of Richmond. A pretty good option right next to the interstate. On the next day, we continue relentlessly south, anxious to get back home. Well, the vacation is uh, nearly over. We are uh, traveling on our journey south of I-95. But we still want to have one more attraction uh, to visit. It turns uh, the, in the 1950s, this, well, there was this uh, firecracker stand in the middle of uh, the, in the border between North and South Carolina. And uh, the engineers happened to run I-95 right next to it. The place became uh, known as South of the Border, and uh, nowadays is the ultimate tourist trap. And we're gonna get there in about an hour. we have arrived. Yeah, it's the ultimate tourist trap, all right. But it's a pretty unavoidable if you're traveling on I-95. Might as well enjoy the faux Mexican motif. There's food, fireworks, and you can enjoy the view from the top of a giant sombrero. What else can you ask for? Oh, oh here we go. There's glass. Ooh. Oh. I can see. Maybe you can wait down there, Mom. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> I guess he can't see us. We're going right on up, huh? Scared. <laughs> I'm scared! <laughs> I'm getting scared. <laughs> uh, Look at that big old sun burrow hat over there. Wow, you can't really see it on Obviously, that little kid doesn't get out much. We continue on this seemingly endless journey, riding into the sunset. We cross into Georgia, and finally into Florida. We spend our last night at the Crown Plaza Jacksonville Riverfront. We also got a pretty good deal using the Hotel Tonight app. In the morning, we depart. Six hours later, we are back in the 305, Miami, Florida. I hope you have enjoyed our week-long holiday road trip along the eastern United States. If you like what you've seen, please subscribe to the channel so I can keep you posted on our next adventure, which will take place in the great land of Canada. Until then, I want to thank you for watching and see you on the road. <laughs>